So, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. And I hope everyone manages to have a place. There are some free seats here as well. So, do not hesitate to uh, come closer. Uh, it's so nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, so nice to be here. My name is Delia Popa. I'm from the philosophy department. I'll be facilitating today a conversation. Uh, between Norman Najari and Etienne Nashil. We will be discussing two books uh, written and co-written uh, by these authors. Uh, the first one is Myth uh, Postcolonial Mythologies, Mythology Postcoloniale, uh, Pour une décolonisation du quotidien for a decolonization of everyday life. This is Etienne Achille and Lydie uh, Moudileno's book. And the second one is Norman Nazjari's book, um, La Dignité ou la Mort, Ethique et Politique de la Race, Dignity or Death, uh, Ethics and Politics of Race. Uh, so these two, two books have been written in French. They have been published recently. Um, they um, ha are actually, they are, uh, have been very warmly welcomed in Francophone uh, um, spaces of discussion. I see this moment today as a moment of translation uh, of uh, some of the content that's there that's, I think, very interesting and challenging to think about for us uh, here um, together. Uh, so uh, we thought that maybe the best way to proceed is to have first a short presentation by each of our authors present here, uh, followed by a very short Q&A uh, discussion between them, because they have questions and questions and answers maybe uh, that can be interesting for us as a, a starting point for our conversation. Uh, Glenn Bracey from the sociology department very kindly accepted to be our respondent is that the name uh, today so he also has questions for Norman and Etienne and then of course you are all warmly welcome to uh, think about questions ask them uh, I'll be here with the microphone uh, to um, uh, yeah help the, help you ask them so uh, with no further ado uh, I let our authors uh, say something about their books thank you all So I'll start. Thank you, Delia. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here with you. So I'm going to take uh, 10 minutes to introduce the, the project so we can have a good idea of what we are talking about here. He's a co-author of my colleague, uh, Moody Leno. Can you hear me? Okay. And so I'll make sure that I mention my uh, co-author, Lydie uh, Moody Leno. So our book was uh, based on a very simple proposition, which was to highlight and unpack uh, the importance of race, uh, the omnipresence of race in the French everyday. Uh, doing so by uh, embracing the two defining features of the French context um, and the French nation, which, is, which are one, the idea of blindness to race. In France, we have a model of uh, universalism in which individual specificities with regard to race, ethnic and cultural heritages uh, religion <laughs> are supposed to be set aside in order to guarantee the cohesion of the larger community. Uh, the French nation is to be one and indivisible. So something that's very important to understand when it comes to uh, our race functions in France. The second principle is the idea that um, France had the second largest empire in the world after the British one. Um, something that, of course, was a defining moment in recent history. And yet, uh, France is a country that never really undertook its own decolonization. The empire was uh, ended in 1962 with the uh, German independence. And yet this history has been largely silenced. Um, it's considered by many to be basically irrelevant. Um, and adopting the post-colonial prism is often considered to be toxic because anti-Republican. This idea of placing race at the center of the debate is seen as an attack to the way we understand nation building and, and, and Frenchness. So in other words, in a French context, you have this idea of blindness to race, silence histories, repressed memories, which um, gives us a recipe that is really um, prone to the development of a certain mythical discourse with regards to minorities, in particular populations having roots in the former empire, Maghreb, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Caribbean. So, by mythical discourse, I am referring to our uh, theoretical framework, which is informed by notion of myth 
as defined by Roland Barthes in his 1957 essay, Mythologies. I will not detail too, uh, too long uh, the, the theory of it, but just to, to understand our uh, basis for this. The myth is a symmetrical system that aims at reinforcing a certain order of things, a certain state of the world, through the dissemination of ideology presented in a neutral, apparently insignificant way. An example that Bart used is the, uh, the famous or infamous black soldier on the cover of a French magazine. Uh, you see this um, um, a young African boy dressed in a military-style uniform doing uh, the, the salute. That's all you see. Um, the idea is that what the image is telling you is very different than this very factual description. Uh, the, the, the picture was published during the war of, of Algeria, uh, at the time when the empire was crumbling, the uh, entire colonial discourse was gaining traction, and to publish such an image on, a, on the cover of a very popular magazine was a way to, to push a certain ideology. You can imagine that the African boy is saluting the French flag, which means in this context that he is actually saluting the, the greatness of the empire and the benefits of French colonization. That's how the myth works, right? And the message is very different than the actual basic uh, description of the image. It works in the gap in between the two. Colonial um, discourse was part of Bart's work on myth, and several of his mythologies deal directly with it. But it was, in his work, a byproduct of bourgeois ideology um, that he was interested in deconstructing in his vignette covering all aspects of French society. So our idea was to, to borrow from Bart his approach based on a systematic investigation of the quotidian and popular culture, very important, uh, everydayness and pop culture, as well as taking his interest in the colonial and placing it at the center of our reflection. We are not trying to posit Bart as a great decolonial thinker. That's not the case. There's a whole set of issues with his uh, approach. But um, we believe that the notion of myth and his approach towards uh, or the idea of probing everyday life do remain productive and, in our opinion, applicable to post-colonial matters. The goal was to engage with France's colonial fracture and more particularly the form of continuum that exists between the two periods. Uh, the idea was not to propose easy comparison or easy parallels between the colonial culture that took place or that shape in the first half of the 20th century and contemporary France. Things have changed drastically between the two periods. But the idea is to acknowledge the, the relevance of colonial legacies, whose extent still needs to be defined, but we can accept the idea that there exist active traces inherited from the period that continue to shape the French collective imaginary. So again, the idea that uh, the geographical decolonization has not been followed by the same work for the French imaginary. Understood here as the way that people conceive of themselves and of the others in relation to the question of Frenchness in particular. So this intervention uh, in the debate is uh, the book uh, is, is, is set on contributing to a long overdue process. The idea is to locate and unpack scenes, signs that insidiously, since they are consumed passively, they are barely noticed, but exercise a strong conditioning effect, disseminate in the cultural landscape a racist uh, uh, discourse that finds its roots in colonial discourse. We are therefore hoping to raise um, awareness with regards to the omnipresence of race in the French quotidian and the role that this social construct plays in the enforcement of social hierarchies. By extent, uh, this work hopefully will contribute to establishing the pertinence of the post-colonial perspective in a country that has historically uh, favored the prism of class only. It's a hard time working in terms of intersection with race, uh, gender, and so on. Something that might seem strange to you, but this is here in France. Now. It's a very specific context, and everything, every intervention needs to be uh, aligned with those specificities in order to really try to grasp uh, what's at stake here. <laughs> so, I'm going to finish <coughs> long just to describe what's uh, in the book quickly. I just have uh, one last paragraph. Uh, we offer a um, little repertoire of representations taken from various aspects of the everyday.
For instance, the public space with street signs that are named after historical figures that were uh, crowned or consecrated for their exploits in the colonies, especially by the Third Republic at the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th century. We have a chapter on, on the window of a random pastry place in which it is, it was, and then it wasn't possible, and then it is again possible to buy cakes made of chocolates depicting stereotypical African characters. And the chef's defense denouncing the tyranny of the minorities and political correctness <coughs> cannot laugh about them, quote unquote, anymore. The news on France's most popular channel uh, and their insistence on the role traditional France as the cradle of authenticity in the midst of demographic changes, and from which overseas territories, former colonies that never achieved independence, are systematically excluded or exoticized. <laughs> we looked at the terms and conditions of the emergence of anti-racist figures in the public sphere through the case of former soccer player Lilian Thuram, whose um, rebellious posture hides a discourse that is rather complicit with the idea of Republican universalism. We looked at the consecration of black writers by important literary institutions in an effort to salvage the image of the famous Republic of Letters. We also looked at the success, rather staggering, of the comedy Qu'est-ce qu'on a fait au bon Dieu? Serial Bad Weddings, which is a seriously bad <laughs> film, which, far, far from being the odd, uh, the praise of multicultural friends that it's supposed to stand for, um, actually manages to s reassure the viewers that certain things have not and will never change. And it as much constitutes a subtle tribute to the idea of eternal France and its inherent specific and rigid conception of Frenchness. White, Catholic, uh, typical understanding of uh, who's French and who is not for certain people. So that's, that's the idea of the, of the work here. Um, I will develop then after, maybe with the questions and, uh, and so on, but I hope I give you a better understanding of what we try to accomplish with this, uh, this book. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. Um, my own book uh, comes from exactly the same context. I mean, uh, many of the things uh, Etienne just unpacked resonates really strongly with uh, my own experience and with the type of situations that I try to address in this book. Uh, this book deals with the notion of dignity. Dignity traditionally is supposed to designate the intrinsic value of every single human life. And one of the things I realized when I started to work on this book is that I think there is a discrepancy between the use of this notion of dignity throughout the um, black, radical, tra black radical traditions at large, not only the American one, but also the Caribbean one, the South African one, and so on. There is a use of the notion of dignity, a white use of this notion of, of, this notion of dignity. But in the same time, uh, usually, and especially in liberal democracy, which use this notion of dignity very, very widely, especially since the end of the uh, war, Second World War, because obviously because of the um, series of mass murders that um, characterize this period of time, some uh, countries, especially Germany, uh, at least uh, uh, um, Eastern uh, Germany and um, Japan, among many others, decided to implement this notion of dignity in their constitutions. Uh, we have uh, liberal democracy that loves to show how they respect dignity, how they uh, assure dignity. And in the same time, we see that usually racialized people, and especially black people, do not really, uh, are not really beneficiaries from this display, uh, self-assuring display of dignity. 
And I started with this simple, very simple uh, notion that every single black person comes from ancestors who were either enslaved or colonized or both. There is no black person that has no uh, ancestors that were uh, dehumanized, whose humanity have not been denied by philosophy, theology, biology, law, medicine, economy, politics, and so on. <coughs> many forms of power, many forms of knowledge were used to uh, define black people as non-human or, or, or as inhuman. So the life of people from African descent is uh, generally degraded in societies uh, historically defined by racism and colonialism. And I think this condition manifests itself through uh, today through overexposure to state-induced violence, lack of institutional support, systemic discrimination, and so on. And those attacks on black humanity shape uh, shorter and demeaned forms of life. What I, I, I tried in, in my book to, to label not as forms of life, but rather are forms of death. Referring to, um, in using a discussion with uh, uh, Italian philosopher uh, uh, Giorgio Agamben. So the pervasiveness of death and loss in black community throughout the world, I think, impacts the very concept of life we make use of, right? <clears throat> if we have a life that is overexposed to death, overexposed to the experience of mourning, which I think is a characteristic of uh, black life today, how does violence impact the way everyday life is experienced and conceptualized? And I think this is one of the strength of uh, Etienne, Etienne's book to show that our experience of everydayness is usually, and that's also something I say in my book, our experience of everydayness is usually uh, thought under the, the, the lens of uh, peacefulness and calm. And, but for racialized people, um, everydayness is a trying experience, right? Everydayness could not be conceptualized as something peaceful as, as something ordinary, right? Because it is characterized by what some uh, psychologists call uh, uh, racial battle fatigue, right? So I think, and I realized that throughout the history of modern and contemporary philosophy, uh, if dignity has designated the inherent and incalculable value of uh, every human life, this definition is meaningless in a concept uh, in, in a context of deep and violent racial, racialization, right? In a context where black people are defined as abject beings or even non-beings. <coughs> so in this context, the very meaning of notions of life and dignity cannot stay and scattered. And I think that black dignity historically <laughs> because the notion of dignity is widely used, as I said, uh, fundamentally differs from its European counterpart. So I, I'm going to skip one part because I'm, 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 I'm too long. Uh, but I think that uh, a characteristic of many African ontologies and many uh, ontologies produced by people from African descent have been to challenge uh, the Western distinction between life and death. Seen in black liberation theology, for instance. We've seen it in, even in rationalist uh, authors like Franz Fanon, Aimé Césaire. You always have in those authors the idea that life and death are not two things that exclude each other but that it is possible to go from life to death and from death to life. 
And this is something that is fundamental in many uh, ontologies of uh, the African continent itself. And I think that those ontologies, this specific notion of irreversible uh, death or life or death experience explains a lot of uh, why black people managed to survive in extremely violent situations throughout modernity. Because they were not as afraid of death as uh, people who do not have access to those ontologies uh, would have been. And because um, they, know, they knew that uh, death do not have the last word. Uh, the dead, according to uh, black people, historically, and black th thinkers, uh, the dead ancestors are still uh, overly present among us, and the living are still uh, haunted by the dead. And black dignity, as I defined it in, in the book, uh, is a capacity to hold between life and death. So it is the empowering form of haunting, I think. Black dignity is, in other words, the power of survival laying in the very depth of death itself. And the power of uh, dead people we love affecting life. And it only exists by the grace of the rich uh, history of political, artistic, theoretical, and philosophical revolts black led in order to impose their denied humanity. And doing that, they shifted, I think, the very meaning of being alive. Um, thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. So. Um, uh, Glenn uh, has questions already. Uh, before uh, hearing them, I would like, if you don't mind, I would like to translate just two short uh, sentences from each of uh, your books. Uh, the first one comes from the introduction of Etienne's book. Uh, he says, racism in everyday life is striking because language is not decolonized, the imaginary is racialized, and the bodies are prejudged on basis of a whole history of racialization of the other non-white. And then the second comes from the conclusion of Norman's book, where he says, black dignity is inviting us to recover the sense of necessity in ethics and politics. In other words, that is recovering the contact with our own misery, our own suffering, and our own intuition of the unlivable. Um, so, Glenn? So, forgive me, I'm gonna stand, because that's just what I do. Uh. <laughs> My knees regret it, but, you know. Um, so, I, I appreciated both uh, of, of the books and both the talks, um, and I look forward to the questions you're going to ask one another, and then if it's okay, I'll ask questions in, uh, in agreement. I wanted to start by sharing my reactions to what you all wrote uh, as respondent, because I believe that they invited me uh, and all of your readers into the basic critical race theory position, which is to question turning the lens. Yeah? Um, if the modern project is one of a singularity, uh, a one of a sameness, one of a, a shared perspective around norms, values, what is good, what is bad, et cetera, uh, and requires in the case of uh, colonization, the, that black dignity or black life be denied in exchange for white life being defined, then a reversal of that lens, I think, gives us a, a, a powerful opportunity. If what you're defining, Norman, as, uh, as black dignity is our ontological starting point, then how then do I understand the, the French position of an advance of modernity and a, and a claim to sameness and never centering race. I think the myth that I would use and that, that invites us into 
is uh, the myth of the zombie. It's the myth that um, it is not black people worldwide who are dead. The question then I would say is who lives, right? That's the basic question of, of modernity, the basic question of whiteness. Who lives, which is deeper even than who is human, right? And the, the debate that they're both having, I think, is who gets to live and whose life is, is seen as uh, the definition of human life. And I think what they invite us to in terms of the myth and the zombifying myth is to see that whiteness is a zombifying event. It is an event that turns what would have been a human being into someone who has given up their brain to a sense of nonsense. In other words, if what whiteness is, if what the French modern project is, is to stop knowing oneself and instead understand oneself as this blank white person, as one of a range of human beings who are all the same in their perfect normativity, then what you're talking about is not the enactment of a, a form of humanity, but instead an enactment of a form of brainlessness, right? So that to be white is to be, or to, to see oneself as white, is to claim to be a non-human, not and, and thus one who is not living, as opposed to the, the discussion that's being had, which is one of, do black people live in what ways do we live, right? That's not the question. We have retained our humanity. We've not only retained our humanity, we've retained the humanity of the living and the dead and of our ancestors and, and of our spiritual traditions and of the law and all of these sorts of things. Our humanity and our lives really are the ones that are beyond question. The question is, are white people alive? And the answer from white mouths and their articulation is no. And it's not no, they're not alive because we killed them. They're not alive because they choose not to be alive. They choose to invest in this modern project of denial of humanity, of others, and of themselves, and, and thus are <laughs> dead by definition, but by, by uh, acquisition of death. So I appreciated you all given the opportunity to see that possibility, right? In what ways then do we see and do we understand white people as the dead and as zombies? Well, I, I talked about, like if you think of what a zombie is, <clears throat> zombies are brainless in the way that I just described. They are a singularity horde. They are a group for whom the sole purpose of animation, they appear to be human, they are animated, they are in human form, but they are not in fact human. The whole purpose of their animation is to consume and dominate in a perpetual way in which it just is an expansion and a growth and an elimination of all things that are actually alive. That is the colonial project, right? <laughs> That is the project of a white person, even as an individual, coming to deeply understand and see themselves as white and, and slowly crush all the human parts of themselves. It's a micro and a macro project all at the same time. And I appreciate seeing that in the, in the daily quotidian struggles that you all are uh, alluding to. So this is not my talk, I'm just a respondent, so I, I will pause there. Uh, and, uh, and allow you all to ask your questions of one another and then I might have so thank you both and thank you all for being here it makes me think of the fact that the, the zombie as defined in the US is actually very different than the colonial zombie and the zombie from Haitian culture on this an idea of how like, uh, Hollywood and others have appropriated a form of cultural, uh, important cultural aspect of Haitian culture and turning it into something that is not supposed to be in the So, just a quick thought about that. No, that's exactly right. And forgive me for using the. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Just, uh, it's very <laughs> stimulating your, your remarks. Uh, my question for, for Norman, and he knows about it, so it's not a surprise. <laughs> 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 uh, we, uh, we indeed have uh, very similar uh, ideas and um, 
observations about the, the state of things in France. Uh, and yet, um, I've been in the US for, for a long time now. And, and Norman just moved here uh, six months ago. And uh, it's interesting to see how this, this, the same observations come from actually different positions in, uh, in the world, in academia, and so on. And I was wondering if uh, Norman could tell us a bit more about what those six months in the US, um, how they have impacted his vision of France, his way of thinking about France, about the race in particular, of course, being immersed in a different setting where uh, racial issues and discourse on race obviously extremely different. Is six months enough uh, to, uh, to have changed anything? I'm just curious about uh, this experience so far for you uh, in America. Well, thank you. Thank you for, the, for, for, for this. Uh, very interesting question. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, I'm here for not very long, of course, but as you said, uh, I see the difference. I see the difference because uh, you mentioned it, right? In France, to talk about race is something very difficult. And I think one of the reasons is that, one of the reasons for that is that in France, there is a constant um, confusion between race and racism. And that, this is something I kind of knew, but I, I think it, it, it was uh, even more obvious. Uh, when, from, from when I started to, to, to work in American academia. But what I mean by that is that um, to mention race in the French context, to mention race, and more drastically to mention belonging to one race, to one specific race, right? To talk as black or to mention someone's, even worse, to mention someone else's whiteness, so belonging to the white race means that you are racist, right? To mention race, to make reference to race, to think in terms, in racial terms, to think racially, to analyze things that happen in society in racial terms, amounts to be a racist in the dominant terms of, uh, I mean, French politics at large. So, because of that, it is practically impossible to talk about race. We have some spaces in the academy, some of them, but most of the work I did, uh, related race-related work I, I, I've done in France, uh, was in uh, militant and activist uh, milieus and, and, and contexts, right? Of course, I, I, I've done my PhD, I've done some conferences, some papers, but most, the most I learned, the most I worked, and the most I wrote is actually in activist context. I, I don't know the uh, activist movements in America right now, right? I, ju I just came in and it's, I, I, I'm very busy in the academy here. And it's, uh, I mean, I'm happy to discover that it's possible to do this academically. <laughs> so that's, that's quite new. <laughs> 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 but, but yes, from from that from that perspective, it's 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 something quite different because I mean here people know what race means, right? That that's that's a change. That's a change. No. Uh, and I just I just wanted to before to ask uh, you a question. I wanted also to talk of of this of this. Uh, Zombie intervention uh, you did, Len, uh, because <laughs> I, I, I find it very fascinating because it is it, it is um, it connects to this the project of analyzing analyzing uh, myth, right, mythology, and it is something that I think it reminded me what uh, scholar uh, Vincent Woodard did in this very good book entitled um, entitled. Delectable Negro, Delectable Negro. That's that's a that's a good title and that's a good book. <laughs> Delectable, because what 
what he what Vincent Woodard uh, does in this in the first chapter of the of the book is to use something something that I, I kind of did too, but he he, he does it in, in a very most subtle and refined way to use um, African ontologies as a way and Africa Afri African mythology as a way to criticize uh, European ways of thinking and. He pointed in slave narratives the fact that uh, East African people often defined uh, white people as uh, parasites, right? As forms of, and it, the Asian myth of the zombie is a myth of, the, of, of parasitism, right? It is something that used to explain how people get power, right? If someone gets inexplicably power, it's because they drain, it's, it's like draining. Uh, um, life force out of other people, right? Zombifying them. It's uh, using people for your own benefit, making them to work, right? It's like, it, it, it's a form of uh, anti-capitalist critique, right? And, and social critique, too. And that's very, uh, yes, I, I mean, I really like the way you used the same myth to criticize uh, what was colonialism, because colonialism was this form of zombie para parasitism, right? of resources, of life force, and of uh, the, the, the forces of, of, of nature as a, as, a, as a whole. And I, I really like this, this kind of uh, playing our myths, our, our, our mythologies against colonial mythologies. Uh, and as so, since you, I had other questions, but since you asked me about the specific situation in America, and since I know we uh, discussed this, uh, this di we discussed this issue uh, a few, yes, <laughs> a few times, uh, I wanted to know what, what you think of the situation, the current, the present situation of French academia regarding questions of race, racism, and about the reception of your book. Because as you said, uh, some people refuse to discuss your book. I mean, the, the reception of the book was not at the measure of what the book provides, because it really, truly provided something new to French academia. But uh, People do not just they avoid to address those questions of the colonial heritage and colonial uh, colonial situation. Something very very interesting you said in in, in the book is that uh, 1962 uh, the independence of Algeria is not the starting point for a post-colonial era, but rather it's the starting point for repressing colonial memory, right and. How, how how does it work now? Do you think we are on the right way or the the, the wrong way regarding uh, French present? Yeah, academia in particular and uh, culture. So for the academia part of things, yes, um, <coughs> and you know that very well, uh, as you frequented this environment for for a long time. Understand that, for instance, the. The title I have here in the U.S. does not exist in France. Uh, my position here in, at Nova is no really such an equivalent uh, in France. Um, if you do anything that's post-colonial, it has to be uh, literary. So there, are, there is a space for literary criticism of what they call francophone literature. that is written in French outside of France. Um, that is something that, that exists, and um, it, it, not, not many, but it is, that space has been allowed to, to emerge in academia and uh, in the larger editorial uh, world. I think that's become a really uh, profitable market also economically. Uh, uh, selling uh, African novels and so on has been for the last uh, um, 40, 40 years something that uh, has been yeah, usually uh, profitable. What I do, this book indeed, um, first of all, we did in French because we wanted to intervene in that debate because doing it in English for us had really no interest. We were preaching to the choir in terms of who was going to read it in English. Uh, although we knew, as you said, that it was going to be set aside by, by many people, uh, it was important that we did something to, to contribute to this. 
it, was, it has been cast aside for different reasons. Indeed, the difficulty to talk about race, and I'll come back to it in a minute. But also because it's not literary. It's um, uh, cultural studies, if you wish, which is also something that in French academia is not considered um, either relevant or uh, is not, to use the term, dignified. It, it, <laughs> to do cultural studies is to do something uh, cheap and uh, not serious work, basically. Um, that's also the reason why uh, the combination of doing a cultural study book talking about the post-colonial was rather suicidal in terms of <laughs> career advancement in France. But that wasn't the idea. There was, there was, we had a big goal, which was to, to um, provide an intervention, trying to recenter the debate on several things that we thought were important, including uh, the quotidien, for instance, which was something that, uh, that's, that's missing in, in French studies today. People focus on the extraordinary a lot, on um, issues of uh, riots in the banlieue, in the suburbs, and so on. No one talks about everyday life. So that was important for us to do that, just as something that people could uh, rely on or find in the stacks one day, and, and you know, uh, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> You're right, yeah. Uh, maybe on Google Books, then. Uh, um, <laughs> even if it's uh, in the future, at least that was, that was the idea. In terms of, of uh, how, and this is a strange position. I, I was born, I was in France. I left, uh, I left France, uh, I was 21 years old, so I did my, all my academia, uh, academic work, uh, grad school and then faculty in the US. And I go back to France maybe once a year, but uh, more as a tourist than anything else now. Um, so I have really have a side or look on things, although the research that I did allowed me to, to dive into the everyday life in order to, to find those myths and, uh, and pop culture. But I see, I see a very slow progress, and it has to do with the rise of the reactionary phenomenon in France, uh, this idea of uh, right-wing, extreme far-right discourse really invading the public debate for the last few years. Um, and this is a very uh, diverse type of uh, phenomenon with people with different ideas. It's difficult to, to, to have a to, 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 to write a portrait of who is the reactionary figure in France. But they do have in common certain things, including um, defense of a certain idea of Frenchness, um, and more and more this idea of refusing the colonial perspective to emerge on the basis of enough of this colonial repentance. And that's something new. I mean, for me, from the outside looking, this idea of, there's a book, of course, by Bruckner that uh, came out in the 80s, right? The Sanglot de l'Homme Blanc. It was one of the earliest forms of uh, refusing uh, what this is at the constant auto flagellation of French towards the colonial. Yeah, uh, the white man's cry of yeah, cries of sobbing, uh, meaning that uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. And he was, he was just elected to the French Academy or something like this, right? Uh, I believe. Yes. Uh, also to the Goncourt, uh, Goncourt jury. Uh, yeah. So another form of consecration for someone who has been working in the. Um, all right, uh, women for a long time. So in terms of evolution, that's what I see. Um, when I said to work on this full time and really dive into this, which was about uh, 15, 16 years ago, there was not that many people in France talking about queer repentance uh, and uh, enough of, uh, of having to make amends for what French people did in the colonies. And that's something that has been emerging in the past, in the past few years that is gaining traction is now almost in every discourse that politicians have had to rely on in order to, to draw people to their, um, to their ideas. And therefore, the, to me, the progress has been uh, hampered by that. On the other hand, the rise of the anti-racist associations to which you contributed has been something also that has been uh, worthy of noticing. Uh, Le Cran and so on being more and more uh, involved, whether or not this is uh, an organization that we need to support any different ideas. But, that's something that, that kind of balance uh, this issue of, uh, of public debate being corrupted uh, by uh, reactionary discourse in France. So I don't know if it's a wash in the end. I would say that unfortunately no. Um, but they are, I just wanted to make sure that we identify the glimpses of, of hope in terms of activism and involvement of the French people into uh, fighting for, for what we believe is an indispensable uh, Defining characteristic of, uh, of, of the French nation and capacity to understand France without uh, embracing the, 
the race aspect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, there's so much to say about these two books and so much to, so much to discuss. Uh, thinking, thinking about their, what they have in common, what they share. You mentioned already uh, everydayness, the importance of everyday life uh, for the experience of the racialized. Uh, another dimension that's uh, obviously precious for both of you is historicity, uh, the importance of history as it happened, not as it is uh, presented, right, officially. And uh, obviously, both of you work in that gap, and you do that critical work uh, that consists in reminding us about what happened. Uh, sometimes just going to the facts, reminding, uh, going to documents, to archives, uh, gathering uh, right uh, resources that are uh, on purpose made invisible is such an important um, uh, dimension of this work you're doing. So um, I just wanted to mention these two things. I would like to open, actually, uh, the floor for uh, the discussion. Um, please feel free to ask uh, any kind of question uh, to Norman and Etienne, who would like to, uh, to start. So. Thank you both for your very productive and uh, <coughs> enlightening talks. Um, my question is primarily for Etienne, but I think I'm pretty sure that Norman can piggyback on it. Um, what, how, how do you, uh, what do you make of Sibet Ndiaye? And, uh, and maybe you can explain who she is and uh, why in the, her presence in, uh, in the French uh, everyday life nowadays, uh, what that means and, and how that makes things uh, complicated maybe. So Sibet India is the government uh, speaker, uh, porte-parole. She a position, a spokes spokesperson. She's a minister. She's also a minister. I think her position is both. I think as a spokesperson, she's a minister. She's like the minister of spokespersoning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So she's an interesting character. She uh, she was born obviously she was born in the Senegal and moved to France uh, at a young age. She was maybe two or three years old, and so therefore grew up in France and um, of course a French citizen. Well, if I were to compare to compare her to what we did in the book, uh, I mean, it's a bit harsh, but. Um, the, the, the chapter on Lyon Turam, which is this activist, it's anti-racist activist. Uh, who does nothing else, in my opinion, than sugar <coughs> putting the official discourse and presenting in a way that sounds a little bit um, as if he is trying to resist things when he's actually, I think, pushing the exact same narrative. Maybe we can talk about the same thing for Sibet and Diai, who, uh, as, as, a, as a black woman, uh, being the spokesperson, as visibility, and this is something that in France is very important because, again, in the U.S., you might not realize, but the question of visibility for minorities is very important in France. There are very few persons of color uh, in France that have a space, uh, whether it is um, on TV, movies, or life in general. So you could think that having Sibet on TV every day, uh, part of the government, is, is a good thing. It's hard to see anything else than. Uh, of tokenization, uh, even the fact that government's policy on those issues have been nothing else than the usual stuff. Uh, Macron has, has not done much, in my opinion, to uh, intervene in the debate in a positive way. He did, he did um, focus on uh, colonial memory a bit more than his predecessors. Um, he had several interventions regarding uh, colonization, when he went to Algeria, he's supposed to focus uh, more, a lot more this year, uh, given the fact that uh, this is the 60th anniversary of the African independences. We're going to have a lot of things about that. So that's something that he has been doing. But again, the terms of it, uh, to me, have not been uh, productive. So I have, I can see I have little sympathy for Sibut and the eye, uh, despite the fact that maybe yes, her presence in the media, on TV, help a little bit visibility of in France, but that's... But at the same time, she defends government policies that include uh, violence. Right. Uh, yeah. Violence, for instance. Which having a, a, an Afri 
versa to defend yeah. uh, police violence. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it creates something that's very powerful and, and uh, yeah. <coughs> nauseating. Yeah, yeah, in a sense, yeah, yeah. She, she, she just, yeah, as a spokesperson, she's not here to, uh, to be any critical of this government, uh, government uh, policies, and therefore, there's nothing to further the debate. Um, yeah, it's not, I, I'm, I'm trying really hard to find a good thing to say about Tibet, but it's difficult. I don't know. Because, because I remember this, this, this sequence on TV when I think the journalist, the, the journalist asked her about if the government policies may be racist. Yeah. I remember that because it's a very unusual question from French, journal, from, from, from French journalists. And she laughed and say, look at me. This government can't be racist because I'm black. <laughs> it was as, it, 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 it was like it, 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 so, yeah. It was like it was just like that. It was as, as direct as that. And yes, she, she, she's a she, she's a funny person. This Sibet and I. I mean, not only because of that, but she, she's gen, she, she's genuinely she's genuinely funny when in her interventions and so on. Uh, but she's the daughter of. Uh, very renowned uh, um, Senegalese politician. And um, I think she tries to fashion herself as someone from the hood, like also something like that, you know, in, in order to uh, build credibility. And because French people perceive black people as just people from the hood, it has strong credibility, but it's simply not the case. And it, it's not, it's not very hard to imagine someone from this background advocating for police violence, because it's not very <laughs> foreign to Senegalese government, right? Uh, and even since Senghor himself, right, who imprisoned his uh, former prime minister, Dia, just for not sharing the same, the same ideas, right? So, Yes, it's 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 not it's not very 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 surprising, and I think she, even with her Senegalese political background, she really embodies this history, this history of uh, France Afrique, right? The colonial, neo-colonial relations and complicities between uh, French elite and uh, East Eastern African elite. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, I'll stand. Um, I have a question, uh, I think, primarily for Norman. Thank you both for your talks. Um, I was really interested in uh, the way you were talking about um, life and death and kind of theorizing a wavering between life and death. It was making me think about um, the geographer Ruth Wolfgang Gilmore's definition of racism, right, where she, de she defines racism as um, group differentiated vulnerability. Um, so, yeah, I was just, I mean, I know I can read the book, um, but I was curious to hear you talk more about uh, sort of how you're conceiving of, um, of life and death. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, this is very, really at the core of the book and at the core of uh, many works I've, I've done after, after the book. So, yes, I am influenced um, uh, by this, this definition. There are also recent works in the same line uh, that I... I'm, I'm really. I was. I've been really interested in, and um, I think this is really important. Those definitions of of of, of life of life and death, and how we can uh, build something from this from, from those definitions. There's a very interesting. Uh, I think from last year, an article by Leonard Harris about uh, philosopher uh, African American philosopher Leonard Harris about Negro being and. Uh, building from this definition of the, those questions of life and death and how in a crisis of defining racism to understand who lives, who die, who parasites, who end up paras parasiting uh, other people's uh, uh, life length, right, um, is a good way for defining racism. But I wanted, in, in this book and using this notion of dignity, for instance, I wanted to go from a quantitative understanding of death to a qualitative understanding of death. That is to say, 
it is very necessary. And I think I, I strongly believe that uh, Gilmore and that Harris and that also other very interesting scholars such as Tommy Curry are absolutely right to, 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 to really emphasize this uh, notion of premature death as uh, fundamental to understand racism. But I also wanted to understand how life itself, and not only premature death, but how life itself, how the fact of living is impacted by the overly presence and, uh, of, 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 of death, of the death of others, and of having a, a form of degraded life. Because of that, I, and I'm going really quick about this because it's a, lo it's a, it's a, it's a long uh, discussion, but there is a <coughs> concept of necropolitics, which is quite famous now, uh, coined by Achille Bembe, a Cameroonian political theorist, philosopher, historian. This notion of necropolitics means uh, it's the reverse of Foucault's biopolitics, uh, how to build uh, notions, political notions of health. Uh, necropolitics is how to uh, decide who uh, is going to die. But there are two notions of death in Greek. We have thanatos and we have necros. And I think we should differentiate thanatopolitics from necropolitics. Thanatos is, for instance, according to Greek philosopher Epicurus, uh, the absence of sensation. As Epicurus said, death is nothing to us because when we go to Thanatos, this uh, fundamental form of death, we do not have sensation anymore, right? Our brain ceases to function and we do not feel anything. So it's just nothingness. But in ancient Greece, Nikros is something else. Nikros is the situation of uh, Greek tragic heroes, for instance, right? They are going to die, but they do not know yet they're going to die in a most terrifying manner. It's also the situation of people buried alive. Their heartbeat is still there, but they are going to die because they're in a situation where they're completely helpless. And it's also the situation of the uh, gladiators who are doomed to fight till they die, right? So all the situation are necro. So I think necropolitics is adequately understood as those situations where the world conspires to make us die early and how we experience those forms of political attempt to shorten our lives or to, to uh, make us going through discriminations, uh, forms of humiliation, degradation of dignity. So I wanted to embrace all this very exciting and very interesting scholarship about racism as creating uh, early and premature death but I wanted to focus on the consequences of that for the living and how we have different forms, different qualitative understandings of what being alive means. Thank you, Blake. Should I stand? So my question is for... Close, thank you so much. So my question... So my question is for Norman. So you mentioned that in France, that one of the things that's come up is that the first person to mention race is like racial race. And I see that this is something that um, is frequent in American academia as well, a claim that of reverse racism. And something that you mentioned about um, dignity and how um, it seemed very pan African that you were tying together a lot of um, how the continent itself generates different interpretations death and living, et cetera, something that Anta Diop also does. Um, and you mentioned that um, between, um, uh, you, you made reference to everyone with African ancestry as either oppressed or enslaved. My question is, could we um, also talk about, is there another formulation for thinking about identity that even goes beyond and before? Um, colonialism and slavery? 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Yes, I, I, I'm not part of uh, people like uh, in the bright way Edouard Glissant or in the dark way Afro pessimists who think that uh, there is a complete break that the hold of the slave ship created, right? That, that, that there is this sort of abyss between uh, the African and the enslaved. I, I just think, because historically it's just not accurate, right? It, 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 the um, cultural ties between uh, the African continent and the Caribbean and North America and South America are enormous, right? And in countries like Brazil, it is absolutely obvious. So if we do not focus on North America and um, it becomes obvious that this thesis that there was a complete break between Africa and America simply is impossible to sustain, right? But in the same time, I mean, the, the changes were enormous. But what I think is that in most of situations, uh, the link between uh, African ontologies and African-American ontologies or Caribbean ontologies is not in the content of the thought, right? It's not usually, and especially it's pleasant to see this in Brazil, because I mentioned Brazil, right? to see uh, the same dances, the same uh, pieces of clothing, the same food, and this, you know, th there is a form of folklorism, right? This is, this is really something like this a, a new form of mythology also, right? But I think what is the most striking is not the content, it's not the forms of the, 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 cult, the cultural aspects of everyday life, it is the, the form, that is to say, how do we think about death as such, not the rituals. What is death for black people in the diaspora? And usually it is what I said. If you see slave narratives, you will have, you, you will have some uh, elements that those people believed that uh, death is reversible. You will have those notions that Vincent Woodard in Delectable Negro mentioned, that is to say, uh, white people are parasites. They're, white people are uh, uh, sucking out our life force. Those are not uh, political thought from, uh, it's not political thought from uh, reformist America or Europe. This is something that came from Africa. These are ways of thinking, not uh, uh, contents, but ways of thinking, ways of seeing the world, right? And really, I, I think those ontologies are the easier form, the, the, the thing that really traveled with the, the, the slaves and that really connects uh, blacks, African diaspora from throughout, throughout the, the, the world. Uh, and anti-colonial uh, criticism, anti-slavery criticism have really common points because for, 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 for uh, two reasons, because anti-blackness, and here I, 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 am compl I completely agree with Afro-pessimists, uh, anti-blackness was quite the same everywhere, right? There is a radicality and there is a form of dehumanization and treating people like uh, if they were already dead, that was pervasive. And also because of the resistance, even if I do not really like this word, at least the, the struggles of African people were uh, built upon the same kinds of ontological uh, perceptions and ideas. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Presentations. I have a question that's more directed toward Etienne, although I think either of you could comment on this. So, um, Etienne, I really liked um, in your discussion of your book the focus on what's everyday and what's familiar. And it kind of got me thinking about 
um, the fact that talking about race in France is something that is neither everyday nor familiar, um, and also the extent to which um, in all of our lifetimes, um, hip hop music and the culture around that and soccer, in particular the French national uh, team, um, might open up spaces to talk and think about race and questions of race in a new way. And, you know, someone of African descent who's paid attention to the World Cup since um, I was a little kid living in Nigeria, um, I, I remember very distinctly the excitement about the <coughs> French 98 team that won the World Cup for the first time and seeing all those players of African descent and hearing many of those players of African descent saying that when they're out of uniform, they regularly get turned away from the nice restaurants and the nice clubs in, in Paris and other French cities. And then fast forward eight years, um, watching the 2006 World Cup final against Italy and seeing France go out to Italy um, after Zidane is expelled on the headbutt. And what was interesting to me in that event was a day or two later, um, Jacques Chirac, who was president at the time, um, gets up and ma made a statement about how Zidane uh, was this national hero. And Zidane's obviously of Algerian descent. And it was interesting to me at the time because I, I remember as a kid, um, I was 10 years old, watching the Seoul um, Olympics in South Korea. Um, and a Canadian track athlete won uh, gold medal in 100 meters, Ben Johnson, who's of Jamaican immigrant origin, and a couple days later um, was busted for steroids and doping. And the discourse in, in Canadian, the narrative in Canadian media at the time was that he went from being Canadian hero to Jamaican drug mm. user, right? Mm. So just kind of thinking about the ways in which um, sport in particular, but also hip-hop music and culture, um, which is quite big in France nowadays, um, but might, um, yeah, be spaces in which people can talk and think about race and, yeah, the discourse around it and frame it in a more critical kind of way. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about one or two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there was great hope surrounding... Uh, Soccer and the possibilities associated to to sports in uh, in dismissing a pro productive discourse about those questions. I hate to be again a bit uh, on the negative side of things, but as you, as you said uh, yourself, the '98 uh, World Cup was a great moment for all of us. Um, uh, yeah, I, w I was I was 14 years old, and it was the best moment of my life, uh, friends, <laughs> and, and 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 it probably still is. Is there? But I was. <laughs> I was, I was uh, for the first time, France won the World Cup, and as you know, soccer is important. And when you win the World Cup, you're the best country in the world for four years. And, uh, and they happened to win uh, on French soil. Uh, France was organizing the World Cup for the first time. So it was a big moment. And the fact that the team was so diverse uh, did spark a discussion about those issues <laughs> because we had players from every possible uh, origins, right? Sub-Saharan Africa, Maghreb. Caribbean. Uh, the best player on the team was, uh, was Zidane, who is from uh, Adrian um, descent. And that victory in 98 was followed by several weeks of euphoria, saying that we had finally maybe achieved something, that we are maybe going to be able to understand that this diversity that we experience on a daily basis in France was a chance for France, that uh, La France qui gagne, the winning France, was needed a diversity to strive. But that was very short-lived. Um, we're talking about a few weeks of this and then back to normal. And I would say that uh, there was maybe the same way that what, which happened in the U.S. recently with Obama followed by Trump, but there was a serious backlash following the 98 uh, uh, euphoria because it's not directly connected, but it's the same period and um, 2002 uh, is a defined <coughs> the same nature with the, uh, for the first time, you had a far-right candidate uh, way to the second round of the election in France. It's not connected, but it is the idea that it, it happens a few years later, right? So I don't think a sport has been able to, to, to push, uh, to, to move things like it could have, for the reason that, yes, it's a diverse team. We have, people, we have, we have black and uh, Maghrebi people, uh, Maghrebi descent, represent France and wear the, the, the French jersey. But again, 
we're talking about spaces where minorities have been allowed to emerge historically anyway, yeah. uh, whether it's sports or, or music. Uh, if there is somewhere where it has been okay to be black and successful, it's been sports and music. And in that sense, it has not changed much. When we win, thank you very much. When we lose, uh, again, it's the same easy discourse, right? Uh, when, uh, yeah, because of course they're Africans, so we lost. It's, uh, it, it's that simple, and the discourse is that simple. And in terms of gaining space to uh, nothing. Rap music, same thing. I think that rap was more productive in that sense, which in France, the rap scene took off in the early 90s. Um, I am NTM, and it's now a huge market. Most people think that it's the second largest market in the world for, for hip hop behind the US. It's extremely popular music. It has maybe helped to send to raise awareness in terms of the life in the, in the suburbs, in the banlieue, what was happening. But again, rap as a genre plays on caricature. It's, it's heavily influenced by American hip hop and the idea of providing a certain narrative that would also get uh, white kids to, to, to buy that music. It's, 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 a, commodity, it's, it's a commodity, it's, it's, it's a business. And to which extent can we rely on rap to make a difference is to me also problematic and probably a bit limited. But I am a bit more keen on, on accepting, on, uh, on embracing what rap has done for those issues than, than what sport has. I think that's been very limited. And I grew up with the rap, uh, born in 84, so I was a teen in 98 for the World Cup, which was also the moment when rap really became huge in France. So we were all listening to rap music. And, and whether you were from or wherever you lived, that was the thing to do. And people singing the, the lyrics and everything else. But no one really reflecting upon what it meant. Uh, no one really um, being able to take this discourse out of the scene itself in order to, to build something political or more productive on it. It does not lead the results that one could have hoped for, in my opinion. I don't know what Norman thinks. For sport. sport, at least. Well, I wasn't prepared to answer this question. <laughs> 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 But well, uh, I, I, I can just say some, something about rap music. Uh, it, I think statistically, uh, it is the most popular mu music style in France, rap music, uh, for, for, the, for, for the moment. I think statistically, it's more popular, it, rap music is more popular in France than uh, hip hop music is popular in the US. If, 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 you, if you take this from the, the perspective of the, the global population, right? I, I think I, I think that's what 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 the the, the stat the stat shows. It, it could have changed, but I, I I think it's kind of accurate. Uh, and clearly, it offered some opportunities for many young people from African descent, both North Africa and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think, like, like, like in, the, in the United States, most of the part of the industry is not under uh, black or brown control, right? It, it is, this industry is uh, white managed, and as you said, for uh, some wide expectations, but I think uh, we have a large and quite interesting independent rap scene right now, and they created their own forms of expression. And well, I think it works. It's just you know, it's no, it's no politics, right? It's just entertainment. Uh, this entertainment is used in politics. We see in uh, many demonstrations in French, we see uh, lyrics from rappers used as slogans, used in uh, demonstrations, used in blogs, in uh, political discourses. So it really, uh, culturally, it has a deep impact, right? And, even if those rappers are not always political as such, right? But um, those lyrics, they really deeply impact the uh, French culture. And I, and I think that that's good because usually all rappers basically say that, well, they hate the police because they're racist. They hate the boss because they exploit them. You know, even if the goals are not really, you know, 
Marxist things or really anti-government things or revolutionary thing you mentioned. Those things are used by the most radical groups in France, right? If you, you see uh, for even the, the Gilets Jaunes, you, 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 you see those uh, lines from rappers used in propaganda. And, and I think those intersecting is, 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 really, is, is really interesting how it became, as, as rap music became part of our culture and of our even political discourse, that's, that's something that, that, that's worth being uh, investigated, I think. Thank you so much. Other questions, reactions? Um, should I ask an, a last question or are you all too tired? Uh, <laughs> um, enough, uh. enough of that. Uh, Norman, you, you end your book uh, with a project of a political ontology. Um, you, you just mentioned that you don't like the word resistance so much, so I suppose you wouldn't like to think of it in terms of um, um, you know, political ontology of resistance, but would you think of it in terms of an ontology of survival that would be somehow inspiring for criticism uh, broadly understood uh, in philosophy today? Uh, would survival be something that, how to say, would be at the core of your project in the way in which you think about life and death, the way in which they communicate? And then for Etienne, how do we decolonize our imaginaries, uh, right? Because we are talking here about an imaginary that informs this everyday life in a way uh, in which it actually supports uh, naturalized ideologies that are going on and solidifies them and so helps them carry on. So how, how do we do that? Uh, the, in, in this book, I... I of course, I have been focusing on, yes, in a way, an ontology of survival. Uh, that's 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 absolutely accurate. I can't deny it. Um, for, for the future, I think I and what what I'm trying to do is to f more to f to focus more on the implications of the of this political ontology to understand the conflictual relations of. Um, groups, minoritized group, uh, with each other, because we've uh, we had a lot of conversations about intersectionality and things like that. Now we realized with uh, scholars like um, Vincent Woodard or Tommy Curry that it's more complicated than that. That there are some issues with, with this, this notion of intersection and the metaphor it carries and things like that. And I'm, I'm interested in uh, how positionalities and even um, minoritized positionalities are conflictual and how it is not that easy you know, to understand class alliance, race alliance, gender alliance, how to understand the precarity of those positions because, uh, because um, yes, all those positionalities, all those positions, those situations, all those intersect intersecting or race, gender, and, um, and, and um, class are not just uh, an accumulation of, uh, of different forms of oppression and that it is not it, it is even not how things intersect or encounter the, each other, but it is rather the building of very distant and very opposed historically political ontologies. That the poor black male is something completely different than the uh, poor black female, for instance, right? That historically, of course, there are common points, right? But the imaginaries are completely different. And what gender means for poor uh, black male has nothing in common with what gender means for a, a poor white male, right? That those ontologies are practically different and that it is even the categories we used right could not are not meant to be universalized <laughs>
right? That's uh, we are tricking with uh, we're tricked by our our own words, right? So, yes, I, I'm interested in the in us uh, say political ontology of of positionality. So say say, say briefly. So in terms of how do we do this, uh, of course, we academics have a role to play, but um, in France, I think, and discussions have been dealing with that for a while now, it's, it's a school as an institution in France has a very specific role, it, probably more so than it has in the US, which has been for the last um, century now, uh, over a century since the late uh, um, 1800, to format the French kids into a certain way, to produce good little French citizens um, in a very rigid, specific format. And, and this uh, institution has been very slow to evolve. Uh, it is, for us, for me, I'm sure it was basically the same thing. And so it's a process of uh, real integration into a specific idea of what France is about and what France should be uh, about through you in the future. And so the discussion has been revolving around the idea of uh, history. Uh, and, um, what kind of history do we teach to the, to the young um, French kids? Um, are we going to be able to finally include the colonial narrative into uh, what has been called the roman national, the national narrative that is a very specific type of history um, based on great uh, names and, and, and dates? But it's still to this day being taught to, to the French kids. There's not, most people in the room will never be able to relate to that history. Uh, and yet it's just, uh, this is the understanding of France that is pushed to them on a daily basis um, at a young age when you are forming your imaginary and you're understanding yourself <laughs> and, uh, and the country that, that is in, in which you, you, you live. So the project I just finished recently was about um, post-colonial sites of memory in France. Um, those sites that crystallize and anchor uh, colonial history and memory, and finding a way to integrate them to um, France's continuous narrative, um, which is difficult to, to, to frame, but that's been for a long time taught, uh, starting with uh, the goals and ending today. Um, you can imagine a very specific type of, of, of uh, narrative. I, I think that this is where the discussion should be now. Um, we have those issues of, of the quotidian and, and race and we're talking about, but it starts with when you get to first grade and you start learning about uh, history, what are you going to be presented with? Um, I, I'm sorry, it's not very original, but that's, that's the key, I believe. And um, finding a way to, to diversify this, this narrative, to include colonial experiment as a defining moment in France's modernity, uh, capitalistic development, and so on, not as a separate history that would be taught in a separate book or separate chapters, but within everything else that we are learning about uh, the tenets of our nation, it would go a long way, a very long way. Um, and we are still struggling to, to do that because it's been very difficult to reform school. It's, it's a robust, heavy institution, centralized in France. It's a small country. Everyone learns the same thing at the same time all over the country. There's been a lot of resistance about this. They tried a few years ago to reform the program. Uh, it's been incredible resistance to it. As, oh, you're teaching Islam uh, and, and, uh, to, 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 to our kids. And it's, like, it's, been, it's been incredibly polarized and difficult, going back to this idea of reactionary climate that makes things very difficult in France uh, to evolve. But that's how I see it. So uh, my role in this is, uh, is probably <laughs> limited. <laughs> um, but we're trying as academics to, to, to contribute by this push towards thinking about colonial, uh, post-colonial France, meaning mainland France, uh, in relation, of course, to the, to the former empire, but mainland France, and those sites that show that you are involving in the quotidian in a space that is marked by the colonial um, and that you are able to, to traverse to those, those spaces in a way that you don't even realize uh, is, is, is already uh, diverse and multicultural and post-colonial. So being able to identify those, <coughs> include them in the a, in a, in a programs would be, I think, a first good step. But let's, let's see. Thank you so much. So changing the narratives, telling history differently, but also uh, dealing with very burning questions such as intersectionality, uh, these are things for us to think about. Uh, Norman Ajari is part of a decolonial school uh, in Paris organized by Le Parti des Indigènes de la République, the party of the indigenous of the Republic. This is on, online, right, available online. They do this work, like, so this is an ongoing uh, work that, that's happening. Thank you.
Etienne and Norman for today. Thank you all for your questions and uh, your being here. Uh, I hope this has been inspiring as a, as a moment, as it has been for me. Uh, thank you, uh, the Fave people who helped us so much, uh, Gina, Nate, uh, and yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, the Africana Studies program who has been at the initiative of this. Uh, Vincent Lloyd, who is not here, uh, could not be here with us, but who's actually, uh, yeah. Uh, at the origin of the project. Thank you so much.